We are getting ready to start, so we need it really, really quiet. My first question is, if we talk loud, can you all hear us? How many of you not want us to use the microphone? Test, test. Is that working? Okay. All right. I guess we will have to use the microphones. Uh, I'm just going to make a few quick comments, and then I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for the evening, and that is Christine Brown. She lives in Hamarok, and she owns a nice little store down there called Coming Up Gifts. I want to thank the uh, Central Beach Association for hosting this uh, very important candidates night tonight. They offered the building and we gladly accepted. Uh, they wanted me to make one announcement, and that is that the annual Labor Day Parade that the Central Beach Association runs every year will be on Sunday, September 3rd, and that will start at what the foot. The parade will start at 1 o'clock. The kids' makeup and all that kind of thing will begin at 12 noon. Okay. Christine Brown, uh, we've got our meeting uh, in July at the South Pomerock Beach Improvement Association Clubhouse. Christine uh, accepted the request that we had to moderate this meeting, and she will be doing that. Um, so we really appreciate her willingness to do that. Rosemary Doby, Rosemary, would you raise your hand with that nice red card? That red card is going to be the warning side for the candidates to stop talking. So be aware. Um, many of you have asked questions and put them down on the note cards. Um, I didn't go through the cards, but uh, Christine and, and Bill ran over here and a couple other people went through. Let's make sure that there's a good variety of questions. So we have a lot of questions to ask the candidates. I'm going to turn it over to Christine. She's going to explain the round rules. So thank you, Christine. Thank you, Dave. Um, I want to welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming this evening. And uh, I here. Right here. Here. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, sorry. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I am a business owner in the situation specifically in Colorado. Um, I, I uh, own my business, Humming Rock Gifts, for 35 years. I'm also uh, representing the Situate Coastal Coalition. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm also part of the HBIA, the Humber Rock Beach Improvement Association, um, which is one of 10 beach associations that make up the Central Coastal Coalition. Um, I am going to go over the, uh, the rules for tonight. The, we have a up to five minute intro per candidate to talk about their, themselves and their experience. Uh, we have up to three minutes for each question and answer, and we have up to two minutes for closing statements. So we're going to try to do this as as well as we can. And um, let's see if I missed anything. Um, oh, with the, all the questions that, and if you have any other questions you'd like to bring up, we have quite a few, and I don't know that we'll get to all of them, uh, but. Hopefully we, we will, and if you have any others, you know, please feel free to, to bring them up. Um, Bill is going through them, as uh, Dave said, Rosemary is going to be the timer. Um, all the questions are relevant to Situate Marshfield. They are they are on purpose, not national, and not, you know they just pertain to us. Um, and I think we'll start with uh, Joe Armstrong, if you'd like to. Tell us a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Yeah. Good evening, thank you for inviting us to this wonderful forum. I actually have lived 25 years right down the street here, so I've been impacted directly by floodplain change issues. My own house was off the floodplain, then I got the call with many people did from the bank. Now you're on the floodplain. But I had no claims. People say no water has come here since before 1948. Doesn't matter, Mr. Armstrong, get ready for that bill. Uh, and as property taxes went up, and uh, that is another challenge we all face here. 
So I did move, sold my house, though I enjoyed a wonderful 25 years in Situate, and I ran a business with five staff at its peak in a little office above Dr. Salento's office there, near Dr. Bellings there. That building is being torn down now. So that gave me perspective, running a business, adding staff, slowly hiring Citroën people, Marshfield people, Cohasset, Kingham, uh, college kids every summer. Uh, gave me perspective as a private businessman I hope to bring to my office here uh, if I'm successful in being elected to the state representative. I did, however, grow up in Marshfield, and I was educated at Marshfield High, graduated in 79. So like a lot of young professionals, I wandered around the metro Boston area for about 10 years before I bought my house on Second Cliff, where I stayed again until I just sold it in, in April. I am still near the water, though, within sight of the ocean, uh, renting a little place that I could better afford in Grand Rock. Because before we, I heard Mr. Campbell was moving to new challenges, I had planned on uh, retiring early from real estate development and teaching guitar for a while. So that's my plan B now, but it was my plan A. And I it will make me happy. But uh, I'm glad we have some great candidates here. I'd be proud to call any other representative, but we'll each be making the case that we feel we're the most qualified. But it's a nice race, a nice tone. I thank my fellow candidates for that. Thank you, Joe. Um, I was remiss in not uh, going over all the candidates' names first, and I probably should have done that. So why don't I do that very quickly? This, what, why we're here is all of these uh, candidates are running for the seat formerly held by Representative Jim Cantwell. And on the Democratic ticket, um, it's Sean Costello and Patrick Kearney. Uh, on the Republican ticket, it's Edward O'Connell and Craig Valdez. And on the Independent ticket or unenrolled, it's Joe Armstrong and Nathaniel Powell. Um, I also wanted to let you know that September 4th is, is a Tuesday, it's the primary. November 6th is the election, and that's also a Tuesday. And the last thing I wanted to tell you is that James from the Mariner and Amy from the Ledger is behind us here um, filming for, so that we can share this with friends or you know, if anybody wants to see this. So you'll be able to see it on their websites. And uh, thank you for coming, you guys. So um, the next candidate, you are Craig. Craig. <laughs> thank you, Craig. Craig Valdez. Association for holding this event tonight. I really appreciate all the good work that you guys do. I see a lot of familiar faces here tonight, uh, but for those of you that haven't met me, my name is Patrick Kearney. I'm running for state representative on the Democratic ticket uh, for Marshfield and Situate. I'm a lifelong resident of the South Shore, and my family roots go back to 1928 where my great grandfather built his original family home on Stone Ave in Situate. And the issues that we're going to be talking about tonight are not just talking points for me. They are a part of who I am. 
I'm the only candidate in the primary election who is employed. Working in both Marshfield and Situate as a captain of both charter and commercial fishing boats, I'm a small business owner. I started my own maritime education software company. I'm a member of the IATSE Local 11 State Channelers Union, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development at the software company Price Blocks. I believe that my private sector experience has demanded self-initiative, discipline, collaboration, fiscal responsibility, and accountability. I'm a graduate of the Massachusetts Maritime Academy, and I'm a proud member of the United States Navy Reserve, a branch of service that requires a command of self, government proceedings, budget planning, and results-oriented strategies. I believe that my combined experience in government, the private sector, and in organized labor distinguishes me as the best candidate to most effectively work hard for our concerns immediately upon being voted as an, in as our next state representative. I have cleaned up the neighborhood with many of you here. I have volunteered for years to teach and train youth in sports, in life skills, in local and civic activities. I have had brown tap water in my drinking glasses and in my showers. I believe that if you're going to represent the people, that you should know the people. And this is why since the beginning of my candidacy, I have knocked on over 5,000 doors to hear your concerns. It is the ripple effect of your concerns, bright ideas, and urgent requests, both now and in our future, that continues to motivate me to be your next state representative. I'm really glad that uh, we're all here tonight, and I look forward uh, to tonight's discussions. Thank you. Good evening. Can everybody hear me on this one? Yes. The first time using this mic. Okay. Uh, my name is Sean Costello. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here. I appreciate uh, you all having us here, uh, and I appreciate my fellow candidates for being here as well. All six of us in the same place at the same time. One of us is your next state representative. I give you all a whole lot of credit for coming out here to hear from us and hear what we have to say. Uh, I'm running for state representative uh, because I believe that I'm the best candidate to carry forward the uh, mission uh, that Jim Cantwell has worked on for the last 10 years. I think we can all agree, uh, regardless of political party, uh, that Jim Cantwell has done a fantastic job uh, responding to the concerns of the constituents here in Marshfield and Situate, uh, and that's what I'd like to continue. Uh, I'm running for state representative uh, with the notion that serving as your state representative is not an entry-level position. Uh, I am a lifelong resident of Marshfield. Uh, I'm a graduate of Marshfield Public Schools. Uh, after graduating uh, from Stonehill College, I came back to my community and I wanted to do something for it. Uh, so I ran for school committee. So I am in my second term on the Marshfield School Committee and have served as chair since 2016. Uh, we've done a lot of great things on the school committee in that time, things that I'm really proud of that have improved our community. Uh, most notably, uh, I led the charge to implement universal tuition-free full-day kindergarten, which is something that our community has been begging for for years, and we finally got it done, and we did it without cutting programs, uh, without cutting positions, and most importantly, without raising the taxes of the people of Marshfield. I'm very proud of that. That's the kind of common sense, forward-thinking leadership that I want to take to be uh, aside from my municipal experience, I have some very good experience professionally as well. Uh, I spent the last four years working full time uh, at the State House as legislative director for a state representative from Quincy, another coastal community that had a whole lot of coastal concerns that are very similar to the ones that we have here in Situ in Marshall. Uh, in that capacity, I learned a whole lot about how the legislative system works. I learned how to draft track and analyze legislation. I learned how to navigate the state budget system, and I learned, most importantly, how to bring back much needed funding to benefit your district and improve your quality of life. I want to take that experience for those last four years up to the State House on your behalf and serve the community that I love. I made the decision uh, about a month and a half ago to leave that position so I could campaign full time, and that's because I'm going to be a full time legislator for the people of Marshfield and Situate on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, making sure that I'm responding to your concerns and being the legislator that you deserve. Uh, I got my start in politics uh, when I was very young. Uh, I was uh, volunteering for Jim Campbell's campaign in 2008 when the seat had been opened. Uh, I became very close uh, with that operation and, and helped lead his campaigns uh, in the future as his field director. 
and now I want to continue his good work. I ask for your support in doing that, and I look forward to a discussion tonight, uh, letting you know about my experience, letting you know about what we've done at the State House, what we've done in the community, but more importantly, what I hope to do for the community. I appreciate you being here, and appreciate your time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you, David Ball and the uh, Situate Coastal Coalition for having us here tonight, my fellow candidates. It's nice to see you all tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ed O'Connell, and I'm a 25-year resident of Marshfield. I'm married. I have two daughters that were raised in town, put through the uh, Marshfield Public Schools, and I'm glad to say that they both graduated from college, uh, one from Syracuse and one from George Washington University recently. So that's a testament to our public school system and how good the education is that they receive. Uh, myself, personally, I graduated from Wentworth Institute, also an, earned an MBA from Suffolk University in Boston. I have over 30 years of private public sector experience uh, working for General Electric Company, Radeon Company in the high tech industry. And then for the past 25 years, with the state of Massachusetts for the State Lottery Commission. Also, for the past eight years, I've been a reserve deputy sheriff, so I've dealt with issues here in Situate, as well as Marshfield and the remaining 25 towns in the city of Brockton and Plymouth County. Uh, I'm running because I've always had a passion for public service, and when I heard the news that uh, Representative Campbell was stepping down to take that position with uh, Ed Martin's office, <coughs> I said that was an opportunity for me to serve uh, for the people of Situate and Marshfield. I've always been involved in the community. As uh, when my kids were younger, I was involved in the school committee at the elementary, middle school, and high school level on a volunteer basis. I served on the uh, Friends of the Ventures Library Board. I also served as chairman of my local Republican Town Committee. I was an elected member of the Plymouth County Charter Review Commission and also served in youth soccer as a coach and on the board. We had a lot of um, soccer games. We didn't win many, but we had a lot of fun. So um, as your representative, I think uh, the main issues I'll work on and that I think are urgent to both our communities is obviously the seawall issue. 
you know, the short-term repairs, making sure they're done on time, on budget, and in a safe manner. The ongoing opioid crisis, as we're all dealing with, as we know, it's not an inner city problem. It's affecting good families here in both towns. Uh, there's a lot of great groups, you know, in both towns doing work and, and having excellent programs that I'd like to partner with as a representative and continue the work that uh, Rep. Campbell was doing. Also, uh, work on, you know, the urgent issue of clean water in Citroën. I know that's, I just attended your meeting, you had Monday night. And for those affected, it's a, it's a serious, serious problem. I know there are other problems, you know, uh, basic problems that every taxpayer has in the town. But that's one of the issues that would uh, have my urgency. Of course, maintaining funding for your schools, to keep our schools well funded, to keep our firefighters and police, giving them the resources they need and also maintaining high level of uh, services for our seniors and our veterans. That would be an ongoing daily uh, occurrence for me as a representative. So with that said, the primary voting is uh, Tuesday, September 4th. It's the day after Labor Day. So hopefully you get out and vote and uh, I can earn your vote. I think I'll have a big voice on Beacon Hill for you. I'll listen to your concerns and I'll bring those issues to Beacon Hill. So, Again, thank you, and uh, hope you vote on Tuesday, September 4th. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we're going to, going to start with the first question. I just want to remind you that we have, you have up to three minutes uh, for each question and answer and I'm going to ask you to just pass the mic down in this order. So our first question from the audience is, what can you do as our state representative to help get funding for a new Situate Senior Center? I was pleased to serve as the uh, Council on Aging chairperson many years ago in one of the several efforts, several efforts to try to get a senior center done. Uh, the seniors have faced much disappointment in this town. We know there are state and federal grants for these kind of facilities. My specialty in my career has been to apply for those grants, to pull together funding, pull together uh, consensus for real estate development projects, typically senior affordable housing complexes. I'd like to tell my clients uh, I am a professional problem solver in that regard. I hope to use the skills that I've gained towards this matter, as a matter of fact. Uh, I would like to say, as someone who was recently a citizen and only recently moved away, that it, I know there have been plans for a joint facility at the Gate School. In fact, on behalf of the selectmen, they asked for my professional expertise. I walked through the building and I said, well, this will never happen. Why? Because it's cross-contingency risk from problem trade. If you're going to try to have a recreation center, town offices, senior housing, uh, long-term storage, four uses in one building all at the same time, it literally will never be done. I would just tell my townspeople because it's four different applications to all different agencies. Once one gets approved, there's a timing. It will expire before you get the next piece done. So my advice over the years has been, if the seniors are ever going to get a facility, it has to be a separate facility, a separate building. I like myself, at least on a temporary basis, consideration of the old Pier 44 restaurant there, which has been vacant since it was used as a temporary library space during the recent library renovation. Uh, again, I'm no longer a citizen, but I'm being asked advice on this. I would suggest that the townspeople focus on at least a temporary use of the Pier 44 restaurant building, which is functional, wired, plumbed up, ready to go. The seniors need something sooner than they're, they're going to get it otherwise. If we can, oh, thank you. Oh, one minute, thank you, one minute warning. Thank you very much, I will watch that. Uh, so I would suggest, again, focusing in on specific grants and applications for use of the Pier 44 building, at least on a temporary basis until such time as the town leaders can better uh, formulate a plan for combined use of the, at the Gates School. And I say that as a real estate professional. According to the uh, Council of Aging, 
the senior population as we speak is about 15% in our town. In the year 2030, it will be 35%. And as part of the baby boomer population, it's going to be even greater. The senior center is very, very important for our community. And I feel that if we can have low-cost housing for our community, which is mandated by the state, why can't we not have a senior center that's much needed in situ? Marshville has a senior center that's second to none in most cities. I think that we could do the same thing too. In fact, many times I've spoken to over a thousand uh, seniors who have um, been to all the different uh, events I've been to, they all said the same thing, is why can't we have what Marshville has? And the answer is, why not? And my goal is to be able to find the funding that we did for Marshville to be able to do the same thing in situ. We could repurpose buildings. And as a real estate broker, I know for a fact that there are buildings that are not used, some of which are being torn down and not even utilized, the land that is. There's a way in which we could be able to do so. As I visited other cities, such as Needham, for example, I've seen a lot of vibrant centers that actually been moved, uh, or I should say, been originated simply because of the fact that there is a need and they met the need. I would like to do the same thing here as well. We do have a need, and I'll definitely find the money as we did in Marshfield, and we'll find the places as we have done in other places, just like here. Thank you. I think this issue is something that's extremely important to the population that is aging and situate. The next state rep, as the next state rep, I will be fighting tooth and nail for grants and funding and form uh, collaborate, you know, form committees and work with the Friends of Situate Seniors. I was happy to sponsor a hole at the golf tournament that you hosted. I was even happier to participate in the bake sale at Heritage Days. I'm still enjoying the treats from there. But uh, I think that it's a multifaceted approach. It's fighting for the funding at the state level to get the grant money that we need to build a senior center. It's also expanding our local economy and increasing our local tax base. If we are supportive of the maritime industries that we have here in this district, we will expand our local tax base. We know that fishermen are going out of business based on regulations that are written by people that don't understand uh, or have never even been on a fishing boat. And what that does to our local economy, um, its ramifications are far reaching. When we don't fish, we don't buy fuel from Sean Harris or Ken Duvall. We don't, our boats aren't insured by local insurance agents. Pete Belson from Belson Bait and Tackler, Scotty Sinclair and Marshfield, they go out of business. And when people come into town and they bring their wives, they stay at the Situate Harbor Inn and they shop at Hummer Rock Gifts. These are the things that we need to be supporting and local businesses that we need to be supporting as the next state legislator to increase our municipal's tech municipalities tax base to have the appropriate funds to fix things like groundwater to make sure that we have funding to rebuild our senior centers and the next as the next state rep I will be making sure that we're supportive of that local community and that local business but also fighting for those grants as well working to build that public private partnership to create an appropriate senior center for the aging population in situation. Well uh, so I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about what we've seen, as I think we're all talking about what we've seen, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about what I've done uh, for uh, the senior population, uh, not just in Marshfield and Citrus, but across the state. So we know uh, that for the first time in recorded history by the year 2020, uh, people age 60 and over will outnumber people age 20 and younger. That's a staggering statistic that we have to think about because that's a large portion of our population uh, that needs and deserves certain services from their government. Uh, for the last four years, uh, I worked at the State House um, and for, as legislative director for a state representative who was actually the chairperson of the Elder Affairs Caucus in the House. Uh, so he, he said, not only did he sit on the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs, uh, but when there was an issue uh, that, that the committee believed needed to be pushed for elder policy, it was uh, put on our shoulders to do that. So uh, we took action when we were examining uh, a few different things with the, the uh, Massachusetts Councils on Aging, and 
we saw that the formula, uh, fu the funding formula grant for local councils on aging, the money that you get from the state to help run the operations at your local council on aging, uh, was a pretty antiquated formula in that it was eight dollars per senior per town. So that's not a ton of assistance going to local councils on aging. Uh, so we did something about that. Uh, I wrote language uh, that was filed as a budget amendment and later passed. Uh, that increased that budget line item and brought in an extra almost $3 million per year uh, for the foreseeable future in that funding uh, formula. That is money directly uh, coming to the Situate Council on Aging. And that's because of uh, legislation that I wrote and that we pushed through. Um, I see some active seniors here. Of course, Gene Young was very active with the Senior Center population. My friend Val Baker, who is very active with the Council on Aging here. They're fighting hard to make sure that you here in Situate have the facility that you deserve. And Gene and I were just talking beforehand that there's $2 million that's held up right now in a bond bill at the State House that was secured in a bond bill, but that has not been released to come to Situate to help you build your Senior Center. Uh, through, through my experience, thank you. Through my experience in the last four years working at the State House, uh, I know exactly how to advocate with the administration to release that funding. Uh, I know how to secure even more funding through that process, and that's what I'll be doing on your behalf at the State House. I'll be using my experience to make actual tangible results come to the people of Situate. Obviously, the new senior center is very important. Um, we have a very state-of-the-art um, senior center in Marshfield. Uh, not only that, uh, state-of-the-art uh, transportation that will pick up the seniors um, and bring them from their house to their activities at the senior center, which I think is also very important. Um, I'm very lucky where I come from a community where we just built a nice, uh, beautiful Harbor Master shack. Um, and Mike DeMeo down there, the uh, also situate resident, um, did a beautiful job and in, in the townspeople of Marshfield paid next to nothing. Um, and he secured all that through grants and through grant writing. And another thing that um, we're doing in Marshfield right now is um, we're, we're filing um, paperwork to get an actual grant writer in town, which I think would be a, a huge help in do the same thing over here, um, I think it, it, it'd be a, just the best thing that I could go for us, because let's be honest, the, the average person, there's a lot to the grant writing process, and the average person really, really can't do it. Um, but those are just a couple of my ideas. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, as all of my colleagues mentioned, the uh, Senior Center is a very important location here for your seniors and for the activities uh, of the town. We're fortunate in Marshville, as uh, Daniel mentioned, to have a state-of-the-art uh, senior center. And, you know, that was something that was funded through grants, also through town meeting. And that was a long time coming. And when it came, our seniors were very uh, glad and they've used it. And it's right up the street from my house, so I see what a great resource it is. So I would be advocating on your behalf to you know, do whatever it takes to get that uh, built as well. As uh, Sean mentioned, this $2 million bond bill being held up, I would work to loosen that up right away. I think that just having a voice on Beacon Hill, you know, being able to go into the governor's office, uh, shake the tree and meet fellow legislators, uh, both Democrat and Republicans to, you know, get our urgent needs taken care of, or at least looked at. Um, you know, if you're too quiet, it's not gonna happen. But if you're up there every day, you know, fighting for your community, it's gonna happen. So uh, I've seen it firsthand also uh, when I, as a deputy sheriff during these uh, recent storms in March. I had to transfer some of your uh, seniors to the warming station in Marshville. So that's not a good situation. You know, situate folks should be able to be in there in a situate, uh, you know, senior center and be comfortable and have all the amenities that you need. Uh, so, as your representative, I would work hard to get the grants, get the money needed to make that happen. As uh, Nathaniel mentioned, we just had a grand opening of the Mass Mar Marshfield Maritime Center in Marshfield, and that's 
that's a collaboration of a lot of local elected officials and state officials working together. So that took a lot of perseverance, a lot of patience. It did take a lot of time. I think it started actually 10 years ago. I'm not saying that your senior said it's gonna take 10 years, but we'll work hard on it and we'll get it done. And I think uh, with the governor, uh, Governor Baker's administration, they've been proactive. I think your town administration is proactive. Marshfield definitely is. So I think I would work uh, with those municipal officials and with the state officials and uh, you know get your senior center built. Thank you. Thank you. Our second question, can you see any help from the state on our water and sewer problems, especially with funding? question again was, do I see opportunities for state and local grants to address our sewer and water issues? There always is. Um, I'm a particular expert of all the people on this panel today. I've made a living out of having clients, communities, housing authorities, private owners, specifically applying for grants to the Department of Housing and Community Development, that's the state agency for community development, to U.S. Department of HUD, to the U.S. Department of Rural Development, which is part of the Department of Agriculture, depending on the part of the state. Uh, that would be Western Mass and into uh, Southeastern Massachusetts. And I don't get paid until I succeed. So my business model has been to work for years, literally years, on pulling together grants and applications, putting the binders together, doing all the paperwork that's meticulous, that's difficult. Uh, I decided to give that career up if I could have my favorite career dream since I've been a Boy Scout in Marshfield to represent my neighbors and friends temporarily. I think a lot of us have shared this dream for a long time. I'm prepared to give up any and all real estate work in the state of Massachusetts immediately upon election to make sure there's no potential conflict of interest. But I recently completed a development of 18 new apartments in North Dakota. And I like to tell people when you start a deal like that, it's four years from start to finish. I hope to have at least four, maybe more, of the voters want to do the same kind of successful work and apply for the outside grants and the funding that we need here in Citroën Marshfield. And I hope to put a lifetime, 35 years of my expertise, to work in that goal. I believe I can be confident in, in my success in that, in that goal and, and seek money specifically to address our long-standing water and sewer issues in Citroën. I've been reminded by many residents that we have groundwater. And in today's uh, day, especially in the town of Citroën and Marshville, it's incomprehensible. That should never happen at all. I think once the uh, issue is known and the Board of Health is notified, the EPA, as well as all the channels up and down the state itself, funding should be available and will be available because it's a health concern. Not only that is a fact, it's a fact that it's, it's a matter of property values, once again. I mean, people know the town of Sitchford Marshall has brown water or leaking pipes, broken pipes, what have you. The DPF, DPW as well as other agencies will step in. I know that for a fact because even small things like potholes in the roads, when they're paying thousands of dollars in taxes, you just call the DPW and they get on it, at least they did for myself. I know for a fact groundwater is even more important because we're dealing with children, with seniors, handicapped, veterans, people that will drink, shower, or use this water for whatever use. I guarantee you that will be changed very quickly. I won't tell you high the sky stories of what the loans are gonna happen and what subjects are gonna happen. But the fact of the matter is it's a health issue. And for that reason alone, things start happening when people know it's a very other problem. So this is a complicated question, and I think it's at the forefront of all of our minds here in Situate. I'd like to first uh, commend the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, John Dennehy, for hosting the special meeting on groundwater last night, and uh, commend the rest of the Board of Selectmen for putting it at the top of the agenda uh, on a quarterly basis. This is something that is affecting all of the residents in Situate. If it affects one, it affects all of us. Brown water is a public health issue. And we know from studies that it does affect child IQ development. 
it's a multi-faceted approach. We need to replace our pipes, our rapidly aging infrastructure that is causing the brown water. We need to make sure that we have the infrastructure before we take more people online in our system, uh, before, before we allow for, for extra building, we need to make sure that our water infrastructure can support that. It's also important to realize that right now, we don't have really the sewage capacity to bring all of that online. So I, as the next state rep, will be fighting for funding to make sure that we replace the pipes. And as Greg said, when it's a health issue that as serious as this, with brown water, and we know the effects of the manganese in the water, there will be funding available, and it's just making sure that we take that from start to finish. I'm someone that when I start something, I finish it. I've been knocking on doors to hear your concerns and hear your personal stories about brown water and the sewage capacity and how you feel about those things. And I'm gonna to continue to do that right through the primary election so that I can take all of those concerns to the state house. Thank you. Uh, so I, I too was at that meeting on Monday night uh, for the, uh, the update select, and I wanted to also say thanks to the select for uh, a very informative meeting and hearing about uh, not just the issue that the town faces, but the work that's being done and the work that will be done to solve the issue. And I think the most important thing for a state representative to realize is that uh, when it's a local issue, they are a partner at the state house and they are supposed to be fighting tooth and nail in the state system uh, however they can to make sure that we are uh, supplementing uh, and, and helping out with the efforts at the local level. Um, I uh, have, uh, as I've said, I worked uh, at the state house extensively uh, on, on similar issues where you try and bring in funding to solve what is an issue that's a locally uh, locally based issue. It's, it's uh, because everything that has to do with your water system is funded by your water enterprise fund, uh, that, that's pretty black and white in terms of where the money can come from to a point. Uh, you know, it, it's, and, and the meeting was very helpful uh, in explaining uh, not the root of the situation, not just because of the old pipes, many of which were put in uh, you know, prior to the 1930s, most of which has been replaced and is continuing to be replaced, and the pipes put, uh, put in place after 1935 are being replaced as well, but it's also the source of the water. So it's two, uh, two things that absolutely need to be addressed, and here's what we can do at the state house. Uh, is there, there's so many similar programs that you can base it on, and this is what I would do uh, as state representative, is uh, create, uh, through legislation, a new fund that will help support municipalities trying to improve their water infrastructure and the quality of their water. Everybody deserves clean, clear, and safe drinking water, and I know the town is working on that, um, but funding is always an issue, and the funding is the, the major role of a state representative. Uh, I know how to create those uh, sources of revenue. I know how to make sure that that money is coming to Sitchman. That's what I'll be doing at the State House. I'll be fighting uh, with the Board of Selectmen on this issue, hand in hand, making sure that we're doing everything we need to do to solve this issue uh, and make sure people in situ can feel safe about the water that's coming out of their taps. Uh, I've knocked on a whole lot of doors. Thank you. Yeah. I've knocked on a whole lot of doors. I have a tendency to look to the right over here. Uh, I, I've knocked a whole lot of doors here uh, in situ, uh, and it's the number one issue that I've heard of. Uh, and not only do I enjoy and, 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 and revel in the fact that I have the opportunity to hear from people about why this issue matters to them, but the conversation we had afterwards on why uh, I'm best suited to address it. Um, it's been a pleasure hearing uh, those concerns, and I'll continue to, and I look forward to fighting for you on this issue uh, and working with the Board of Selectmen as your next state representative. Alright, so this is a multi-level problem. That you guys are facing firsthand. Um, it is something that I do have a lot of um, experience in. So, what's going on in Sidgwick is, is, is not only the pipes, but it's the manganese in the pipe. So, before you even think or, or really go ahead and replace your, your water lines, you've got to take care of this manganese problem, which means you've got to get these filtration systems in place, um, get your reservoirs straightened out. Um, and there is money out there to do it in the watershed acts. Just, we, we just gotta go out there and get it. And as far as your, your 
sewage, um, yeah, your uh, the town of sewage is probably maxed out and situated. Um, but that does not take away from the fact that there is still Title Five. You can have your own septic systems here. Um, and under Title Five law, um, which does protect your, your your drinking water and your groundwater, um, if, if your system is in failure, there there are tax benefits for you replacing your system, which on the flip side also helps your, your drinking water and your groundwater. And it's something to look into. Um, so those, those are just two major things. I think we're, we're jumping the gun a little bit by, by replacing these lines before you get the filtration systems figured out and you get your reservoirs figured out. Um, if I, in situate two, I'd also be looking more toward a well system if, if, if it was up to me. Um, the wells are just a little bit more cleaner water. Um, and as you guys know, when, when there's a drought, you guys you guys put on water restrictions, and, and, and the water just isn't as clean probably coming through. There's a lot more chemicals in it because they got to filter it and clean it just a lot more because you're basically running off the bottom of your reservoir. So those, those would be my suggestions. That would be that that'd be where I'd start. Thank you. Uh, I too was at the uh, the meeting on that uh, talk specifically about this brown water situation. I found it you know, very informative, but also what I found most informative was uh, at the end of the meeting when all the residents had their personal observations and talked about what was going on at their home. It was very, very uh, dramatic to see some of the you know, filter systems that looked like a pot of sludge or uh, you know, a pot of coffee. So, that took me aback, and I was struck by, you know, how many residents had this problem, and it has been going on for some time. So, again, not everyone's uh, affected by it, but for those who are, like, it's a, you know, it's an emergency situation. It's an urgent situation, and I would just, as your representative, I would sound the alarm. I would, uh, you know, I know your officials have been working on it. It's been an ongoing problem. It's it's a civil engineering problem, it's an environmental problem, but I would try to get all those uh, professionals together and really work this problem to get it fixed and fixed soon because Situate is a beautiful coastline community just like Marshfield and that's the reason I moved to Marshfield over 25 years ago for your you know, beautiful coastline, clean beaches in a great safe community. But not having clean and pure uh, water for your family drink and to bathe your children is uh, it, it's, it's just not right. Uh, so that would be a very big concern for me and I would work on it from day one. Uh, as we saw what a little press could do, all of a sudden Monday night there was uh, national TV cameras there. Maybe not national, but all the major channels in Boston. You know, um, Fox 25, uh, I believe, uh, NECN, there's a lot of media exposure, and that's what we need for this problem, to get some attention from Beacon Hill and hopefully even uh, from the federal government. So, uh, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, our next question, uh, we've combined a, a bunch of questions. This is on everybody's mind, it's about seawalls. And uh, as we all know, Jim Cantwell was great with getting grants for uh, repairs uh, of our seawalls. Um, how should the town of Situate finance seawall repairs that are expected to total $40 million over the next 10 years? And specifically, the Sand Hills, Hill, Sand Hills Lighthouse Road seawall was built before 1907. It's rotting from the inside. What will you do to help get state funding to replace and sustain our seawalls. First, first of all, we have to research the issue. I know myself, anytime I tackle a client problem, sorry about the sound issue here, folks, we turned it up enough to hear it, but maybe get a little feedback. Uh, so, I did my research, found the 2015 State Coastal Erosion Commission Report, read it, uh, look at the charts and graphs that were there, and one statistic addressing this question came right out, that though the coastline for Massachusetts in general, there are 27% of the coastline has an engineered protection wall 
culvert or some man-made uh, protection on it statewide. For the South Shore, we're at 44%, North Shore is 46 so twice as much here. It means we're better protected, but as the, the moderator just pointed out, a lot of this is aging infrastructure and needs to be replaced. It is a long-term problem that requires long-term solutions, and the patchwork approach I think that has been taken is not the one I would recommend. It is something that will need uh, typically matching funds from the state, federal, and uh, local sources. A lot of grant formulations I've worked on on similar projects for housing, for instance, require local participation. Part of my goal is to get that as low as possible. I hope to do the same thing and use my specific uh, project coordination and follow through record of solving large infrastructure problems in other communities uh, of up to $125 million is the largest transaction I've worked on uh, four years again. It's, uh, I'm hired to solve problems uh, and grab that, uh, grab that problem like a dog with a bone until it's solved. And 98% uh, of the time, I solve the problem for the client. That's why I've been successful at it for 20 years now. Again, I simply hope to put all those skills. None of us are going to be able to promise specific grants, specific approaches until we get into it. But I see, yeah, half of our uh, coastal areas protected by walls already. We're considering new walls, expanded walls in Marshfield, right in my neighborhood in Brown Rock. Uh, Jim Campbell was successful in getting $1.2 million down to Marshfield in that example to increase the height of the wall. I congratulate him uh, for that great work and hopefully will protect the Esplanade there at Grab Rock, which is just a wonderful little community. And I will turn over the mic to the next candidate. Thank you very much. When we talk about seawalls, um, I think of it as the primary line of defense for reefs, destruction, or erosion, but actually it should be the last line of defense. The reason being is because our seawalls are crumbling on a rate of every three or four years before pumping money into a seawall. I received a notice in the mail where it says that the um, city wanted to take back two feet or thereabouts. You might have got the same uh, letter so that they will be able to increase the seawall by two feet. Meanwhile, they will be repairing the seawall itself. I don't really see that being the solution. I wanted to be able to be more innovative and look at other ways in which we can protect the seawalls. First, repair them, repair them, but then to protect them by having other structures so that the wave, the structure, the force of the water, and the wind velocity becomes less adapted to the seawalls which is kind of like a dumb effect because once it hits the seawall, it's supposed to be the seawall itself, down to the homes, it carries all the rocks and boulders actually, into the homes, then you have insurance claims and so forth and so on. Uh, living across the street from the ocean properties, I get the uh, after effect of all the sand, debris, and other hazardous material that comes across. Um, and if I could just add something that's similar to, tandem to the subject, is the amount of pollution that comes from plastics. And I think that's very, very important because that all have, comes to do with the erosion and more importantly, protecting the ecosystem. So when we talk about seawalls, we should look at a multi-disciplinary approach. We look at the sea, the harbor, as well as all the homes around it, protecting its value. Going to the subject of uh, the historical uh, situated lighthouse, it's something that really is history. It's because of the White House itself, we enjoy the freedom that we have instead of being owned by another country. I think that's very important. So what we need to do on a historical perspective is to be able to get the funds from a lot of the different agencies, whether it's a historical preservation society or what have you, so that we would not be protected for a landmark historical uh, structure, but also because of the fact it's a private situ. That's what gives situ its, it's uh, notoriety, if you will. But I, think that this, but I think the seawalls are something that's very important, but we need to have other structures ahead of it so that the seawalls don't get crumbled every five years. That's, thank you. So being someone that lives right down the street here on Lighthouse Road, I think seawalls are extremely important. I'm going to touch on that subject uh, after this, but I do think that there are some loose ends that need to be tied up when uh, talking about groundwater. Eight, there actually are 22 wells in situate, but only eight of them are online. So we need 
green sand filters to clean the water and bring those other 16 wells back to service. Uh, I'm sorry, the other 14 wells back to service. The other thing is, I was the only candidate last night that went, spoke, and stayed to the end of the groundwater plan to hear all of the concerns of all of the people. And I think that that's what's a little bit wrong with government right now, is that not all of our legislators stay to the end to listen to all of the concerns of the people that they're going to represent. We need to elect people on Beacon Hill that are going to take the concerns of all of the people and fight for all of them at the state house. In regards to seawalls, uh, I don't agree with everything, uh, or a lot of things, that um, the Baker and Polito administration have put out, but I do commend them on the $280 million that they've secured for coastal resiliency projects. I'm happy to be joined and um, endorsed here tonight by Dave Ball, uh, and I look forward to working with him and the Coastal Coalition, Joe Gossie, uh, to explore all of the ideas um, and hear from all the coastal residents all of their ideas. Seawalls are very important, but they're very costly. They cost about $4,000 a linear foot. What we need is a legislator that is not only going to make sure that they're repaired, but they're a legislator that is going to explore innovative ways to protect those seawalls. Uh, Fred is here tonight. Um, he, I sat with him at uh, Dunkin' Donuts a few weeks back, and we talked about the effectiveness, the possible effectiveness of wave attenuation devices, which reduce the kinetic energy of the wave before they hit the seawall by seven eighths. So it, when we replace the seawall, if we have something that is reducing the energy of the wave, that hits the seawall, our seawalls will last longer. It's also, the, it's also the fiscally responsible thing to do because they're $1,200 a linear foot, and not $4,000 a linear foot. So it's important to make sure that the infrastructure that we have that's falling apart is repaired, but also that we're forward thinking and take a comprehensive approach to protecting our coastal properties. These wave attenuation devices, seawalls, beach nourishment, it depends on the area, but they're not only the homes that they protect on the coast. There are over 2,000 homes in Marshfield that are in the floodplain. There are over 1,500 homes in Situate that are in the floodplain. All of this coastal protection infrastructure protects everybody that is at risk from flooding from these storms. I look forward to fighting for all of the funds uh, to replace the seawalls and also advocating for other innovative solutions to protect our coastal Thank you. So, coastal infrastructure uh, is a very complicated jurisdictional issue uh, that is, is absolutely should be at the forefront of the mind of the next state representative. Uh, but more importantly, our next state representative should be somebody who has experience working on these issues. And as I've said uh, before in this forum, uh, for the last four years I worked at the State House. Uh, and I was an active member uh, of the Legislative Coastal Caucus. Uh, my, the, the, my former boss, Representative Ayers from Quincy, represents a coastal district, and uh, because of that, uh, he, he was one of the founding members of the Coastal Caucus, which, by the way, as I'm sure many people in this room here know, was led by Jim Campbell. Uh, Jim was not just a statewide leader on the issue, he was a, a national leader on it. We need somebody who's got the experience in order to go up there and fill his shoes, and that's no easy task. Uh, one of the biggest accomplishments uh, of the Legislative Coastal Caucus is the Dam and Seawall Fund, uh, which is a fund that was created by a group of legislators that uh, you know, is, is available annually to, uh, you know, it's competitive, uh, and Marshfield and Situate uh, in total have gotten about $16 million from the Dam and Seawall Fund uh, which is one of the highest amounts for a single legislative district. Uh, not only did uh, Jim Campbell create it, but uh, the funny story about Beacon Hill is that every time he would advocate for more funding uh, through that fund, the uh, other representatives would call it Cantwell's Dam Seawall Fund. Uh, and so we need somebody who's going to keep pushing like that to make sure that we're fighting uh, our hardest to bring in that funding. Uh, I know how to do that. Uh, 
we have secured in Quincy, working with the rest of the delegation that I used to work for, uh, we secured about $17 million over the last four years through the Dam and Seawall Fund. That's something that I worked on uh, with, with Bruce's office, and that's something that I'll lead on your behalf. We need a legislator who's going to pledge to go up there and continue to fund that, uh, that Dam and Seawall Fund, which I will do. I'll continue to, to advocate for even more funding through that. Uh, that's that's one step of a, of a three-step plan that I will put into place as soon as I get uh, to Beacon Hill to deal with coastal resiliency. The second step of that plan is a long time ago, our former representative Frank Hines uh, commissioned a DCR study that would go around and grade, give like an A, B, C, D, or F grade to all the seawalls, uh, and then estimate how much money it's going to cost. That that study. Uh, was completed, but of course it was commissioned by Frank Hines. That study needs to be updated. I'll be fighting and I'll be filing legislation to do that. And third, uh, I'll be working uh, to bring in funding to the local level so each town and city like Situate and Marshfield can hire a grant writer uh, to deal with coastal resiliency projects in specific. So I'll be working very hard on your behalf and utilizing my experience uh, and I'll be an, not just an active member of the Coastal Caucus, I'll be a leader of the Coastal Caucus. Seawalls are very important, um, obviously because we are a coastal community, they do protect um, all our, our infrastructure, especially in Situate and Marshfield, we bring in a lot of money through uh, the beaches, retail, um, beach rentals, um, the seawalls are extremely important, they do need to be replaced, but like many um, previous candidates have stated, that we need to start thinking outside the box, be a little more fiscal responsible. responsible. Um, we have to start uh, the way continuing devices. Um, not only do they protect the seawalls because they break down the actual tidal force of the wave, um, they also um, bring more beach nourishment to and from the seawalls and actually will grow your beach and to the fact that down south they are moving these farther and farther out because the beaches are growing down. They, there is a big study down there, uh, South Carolina. Um, they are working, they're working with remarkable, um, positive results, and I think those would be those would be perfect around here. Um, it's my understanding too that there are three areas in situate where um, they want to do, uh, I don't know if they want to bring the dredging in or make like man-made beaches here, three separate areas. And my, my one, case would be like, well, let's try this out, let's get the funding, let's build enough for these wave attenuant devices to protect that one area and, and see how much this beach grows and see how much it helps and see how much it protects our coast. Um, the, the sea walls need to be repaired, but they need to be protected uh, on top of that. Thank you. Uh, some great ideas for my colleagues up here at the table. Uh, I would follow this the same protocols. I just think that this is a methodical uh, procedure you have to do. You have to reach out to your fellow legislators on a state level as your representative and advocate for the money that we, we have been getting and for our share of funds that are available going forward. We got a $41 billion state budget. I think we can squeeze some more money out of that for emergency repairs on our seawalls. Uh, there's a lot of Studies being done, I think we have enough studies, we need more action. I think with a representative that's uh, out in front of this and with a friendly Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito administration, who has already put aside a significant amount of money, as uh, Sean mentioned, and are very uh, proactive. And, and as a matter of fact, the Lieutenant Governor was just here in Marshville yesterday uh, for the grand opening of the Marshfield Maritime Center, which, again, she's just coming down to show us support uh, through the funding that she got through the state and the collaboration that she did with our local and state officials. So I think if we could just keep this issue on the forefront and uh, keep working with our residents and with our elected officials, we'll do well. I was just at a meeting in Marshfield, again, of, uh, a group of Ocean Bluff residents. So. They have a separate issue where it's revetment. It's not a seawall issue. It's, it's stones and boulders that have been 
rolling away over the years. And that's, again, it's nature, it's sea rise, it's the extreme storms we've been seeing, but they have a real issue. And they feel like they're being left out of the uh, progress that's being made on the rest of the seawall. So uh, with that said, I would work hard for all residents and try to address your concerns, bring those to the state house, and get some action done. And we look for innovative ways to protect the walls and our beaches also. I think the wave attenuation barriers are a great idea. I think the uh, you know searching for alternative revenue funds like the Historical Preservation Act for funding uh, for the seawall portion at the Sand Hills Lighthouse. I think that's a great idea. So you know those are all good ideas that I would try to follow. Thank you. To expand on that, uh, on, on this subject, we've had many questions uh, specifically about WADs or wave attenuating devices. I know that there are probably a lot of people in the audience that don't know what that those are, and we can explain that if you want to uh, take a minute with a Situ Coastal Coalition member, or you know, we don't have to take up a lot of time with the with the definition of that. But uh, at the same time, some of our candidates didn't get to address that. So uh, this is combining a bunch of questions. I have a three-parter that kind of goes along with that. Um, the first part is, do you support hard reinforcement of, coast, uh, of the coast or soft coast dunes? Uh, the second part is more specific. Why is the sand in the South River being moved to uh, offshore? Uh, instead of Hum Rock Beach, and do you support this, um, this the dredging project of, of the South River? Um, and and then the third uh, thing is Wads, if you'd like to uh, address that. Wads, Wad, uh, wave attenuation. Wave attenuating device. Uh, clearly, every piece of our coastline is going to have slightly different solutions depending on specific uh, conditions. We would look towards scientific uh, opinion and studies uh, as represented as any of us before trying to push a specific, specific solution, working with Coastal Coalition partners and others in town who have been dealing with this issue. None of us as state representatives, I, I guess there's someone who has this career experience, I'm unaware, has ever dealt with the engineering aspects of this. I would say, however, that uh, whenever the federal government can spend some money on the wall solution, it's good. There is some recent news uh, on the fourth cliff where the military reservation is that they are going to use a technology called armor wall to create a hard shell around that cliff and I, I walked down there and you could see they lost some condos up there that were recreational condos for servicemen and women. It's been a recreation base for many years now but was once an active military and Navy communications base during World War II. Uh, the problem is also is the hazard to navigation of sand slipping off that mount uh, constantly into the already restricted channel there in the river. Again, hazard to, to navigation. So in that particular situation, that stretch, the wall seems to be the consensus with Corps of Engineers and other local officials on that point. There are other sections where the wall isn't the solution. I live right on Peggy Beach and I still read every year there'd be the big mound of sand that was piled up in the parking lot and they'd bulldoze it to refresh the beach right before the season. Obviously it's very expensive. Some of the neighbors would joke that, well, you know, this will last one season and say goodbye, it's go going out to the ocean. Of course, that's, that's the give and take, the back and forth we have to deal with here. In some cases, it's going to be uh, dredging materials from different parts of the state, uh, one part of our community to another part of the community. Uh, in, in regards to the specific question about use of dredging material locally in Hummerock rather than taking it shore, I'm not familiar enough with it to know whether this is a private portion of beach or not. Uh, I would say, however, that even when there's privately owned coastline, it obviously has impacts directly on the public pieces of coastline that are adjacent to it. So if there is, uh, that there will be, and there should be appropriate situations where even a private beach should be protected with dredged material that's pulled up from some of our public 
beach areas. Uh, at the same time, I do understand one of the problems is the easements that are necessary. The basic quid pro quo here is if a private beach owner with a section of, of wall or beach at risk wants help from the state, state federal government, you have to sign away certain easement rights. This is legal before they can let town employees even on the, on the property. There are liability issues, but also access issues because if you're sitting in the selectman's chair, for instance, you're gonna have to answer questions like, why are we spending local money to protect this person's private beach? I can't walk on that beach. Now, I've heard that from some people. I think that there are limited easements that can be considered and are being considered. Temporary easements, uh, shoreline 15 feet up, etc. So again, I don't proclaim to have particular expertise in this area from an engineering point of view. As a real estate development consultant pulling together a wide variety of infrastructure work, though, I would say that uh, these are uh, solvable problems uh, that will require all levels of government to work together. And I look forward to participating in that as a state representative. Might have to send on this one. Uh, it appears now that I took the time to print out. Now I know everybody cannot see this, but I'll have this here for viewing. I'll you know, right pass this map around if you would like to. What this shows you in a short form is that this whole band of blue, which is not just around the coastline, it's rough the whole two or three or four streets inward from the coast itself. So the seawall is very, very important for primary protection of the home and the front line. But we're talking about equal structure, equal systems rather, the marshes, the towns, the harbors, and a lot of other places that the uh, sea walls may or may not protect. So we need to invest upon uh, ways in which we can have secondary structures so the sea wall is not the primary line of defense, as I mentioned before. Because if we do that, we're really fighting against ourselves. Many times we also try to get sandbags and, and other types of things to help shore up the, the houses and, and the businesses in town. The problem with that is, is that it's a little too little too late because we know that growing series is a way of life. It's gonna happen every time. And when we talk about 100 year storms, we should be thinking of it that way. We should be prepared for the unexpected. We know that the Nor'easters are always gonna happen whether it's one or 20 of them. Like we did last March, we had four in one week. Uh, Humwalk uh, was literally flooded. And in any given town, including uh, where it's at Green Harbor or in Sand Hills, we were three feet underwater. Now, there has to be a way in which we can figure uh, solutions to this problem. Uh, when I mentioned about the ecosystem itself, it's very important because we're talking about indigenous species that are getting wiped out. And when we lose the saltgrass and we have invasive species like uh, Franklin Mines, we end up destroying our natural habitat. The seawalls are very important to provide um, refuge for all these uh, small animals, plant life included. Regarding wads, uh, systems, and other types of devices, um, I also looked up some different uh, possible solutions besides just the seawall in itself. And although these are kind of things that maybe people are not familiar with, they do have its value. Uh, for example, um, we heard the word of uh, beach nourishment. What that really means in a very common form is just being able to take the, the sand from one area and or taking sand and rebuilding the beach at that motion. Um, and we can go into things like offshore breakwaters and, uh, and wave, uh, whisper wave uh, structures out. But we need to have enough structure that will limit both the wind velocity, which is very important, but also uh, the water structure. Thank you. So I believe the first question had to do with hard or soft uh, shoreline protection solutions. And I believe that depending on the particular area, it depends on the solution. Sea walls don't always work, uh, say at a Peggy Beach, but uh, planting beach grass does not work on Cedar Point. Um, so looking at it in a comprehensive uh, approach, we need to explore any and all solutions uh, for coastal resiliency. When it comes to dredging on the South River, uh, it goes back to my earlier point about supporting our local maritime economies. Marshfield and Situate are two uh, of the top 10 largest fishing ports in the state of Massachusetts. It brings a 
It's a vital part of our local economy, making sure that our fishermen, our lobstermen can get out to do their jobs, making sure that uh, Rich and Stacy can continue to rent boats at the Hummer Rock Boathouse and be supportive of small business. That, that's extremely important. So the dredging on the South River, I think is necessary. Uh, where the sand goes, I would have to uh, talk with more residents. I know that there's an easement and as Joe said, liability issues um, with where the sand goes. Uh, when it comes to wave attenuation devices, it kind of is a uh, opportunity to explore both the hard and a soft solution because we know that with the holes in the wave attenuation devices and how they're shaped, they actually build beach on the back side of the water. So, uh, and it's been discussed tonight uh, with, with my opponents uh, talking about grants and money. Uh, wave attenuation devices, as I said before, are the fiscal, fiscally responsible solution to this. Uh, the legislature, in their last session, although they did a lot of great things, failed to fully fund public education. They let climate change initiatives expire, and they said they didn't have time to pass the hands-free texting while driving law. That should be a bipartisan issue. So when it comes to fighting for funding or um, just having this unlimited budget, it's it's not it's not reasonable, and that's what's lost on Beacon Hill. So we need to look at One minute. a pilot program for the wave attenuation devices because it's half the cost of the seawall. It protects the existing seawall, and it protects the coastal residents. I also think we need to be exploring new and innovative ways to protect our shoreline. Uh, so, so wave attenuation devices, that they're, they're really uh, a very interesting concept. I know Fred Dorr is very involved with those. Um, I forgot to tell Fred when I walked in that I remember him from Furnaceburg Middle School, even though I had a different science teacher. Um, so so that's, a, that's a very uh, unique way to address some of the issues, and it does have a whole lot of other benefits as well. Um, and, and that's something that can be uh, you know, the beneficiary of state funding and a, and a good way uh, to explore uh, some sort of program to implement wave attenuation devices would be through the Seaport Economic Council, which is something that I've worked on in the past, uh, where it's chaired by the Lieutenant Governor. They were in Marshfield yesterday, as Ed said earlier, for the new Maritime Center. They helped fund our Maritime Center there. They helped fund projects here in situ. Uh, Seaport Economic Council is a very good thing that we can be applying for funding from as well. Um, you know, when it gets down to uh, the dredging issue, uh, you know, right now the, the, the North and South Rivers uh, are, are considered one of the most dangerous inlets in the entire state of Massachusetts. Uh, and for a little while now, there's been money held up in a bond, of about five and a half million dollars to dredge the area. Uh, I, uh, again, I know how to work with those bond bills. I know how to work to secure that funding and get it released. I'll be working with our state senator to do that, uh, secure that funding. We'll, we'll, we'll be making sure that we're fighting for that. Um, and when it gets down to beach nourishment, too, I want to say that the, something the state rep should be fighting for uh, with that issue is, is uh, deregulation. Uh, the state, in so many ways, and just in general, when it comes to beach nourishment, the state regulates uh, far too much how we can uh, re-nourish our beaches. Um, one, one very effective, proven effective method is sand mining, which is uh, you know, having, a, having equipment out in the ocean and, and literally with a, with a big long tube of pumping sand uh, back onto the beach. And that helps in a couple different ways. That makes it a little safer out there uh, and it also nourishes your beach. So we need to be looking at funding for all of those things. And again, as an active member of the Coastal Caucus in the legislature, uh, I know how to secure that funding and I know how to deal with those issues. Uh, and I'll be working very hard on your behalf to bring in that funding uh, through the Seaport Economic Council and through other various means of sources through that bond bill get it been released to make sure that we're certain here in situ. I'm going to start off by saying I think bonds are your answer. Um, especially if you look at the Fourth Cliff area. Um, before you even get started there, you got to figure out how you're going to Replenish your beach in front of it um, because my understanding is that Fourth Cliff is not losing um, all, all, its, all its ground there because of uh, actual tidal forces, losing most of it now because of the rainwater because it doesn't have any vegetation there. Uh, the base, the beach, and then now you can replenish your the vegetation, get your vegetation going there to hold up your beach. That's your answer there. So that's a soft scape or a, a soft.
why I think you go from Wad to your answer. They, they help replenish the, the beach, and, and it's been proven down south that it will be farther out uh, as the beach grows. Um, you're just wasting your money if you're gonna if you're gonna dredge something and then put it on the beach. It's gonna be gone. It's been proven. It's been proven in Hummer Rock. It's been proven in Red Sand. Um, and, and to dredge it and to put it back on the beach just costs it's astronomically more money than it is to dredge it and just dump it back out the ocean. It's been, it's been proven uh, dredging the Green Harbor uh, Channel there. Um, so those, those are my answers there. I think wads are your answer. Um, another thing that we could look at, and especially Port Cliff, um, I know down the Cape, um, Gossett specifically, they're, they're using a bladder system where they're using this bladder system and it's almost kind of, it, it's better than the sand. What it does is kind of hold I'm not 100% positive how exactly it works, but with the, with the, with the tides, it, it keeps the sand there, so there's a lot less erosion. It, they've had very good success with it. Um, it's just something else to look into. Um, but I think, your, I think your answer is, is your walks, and it's, all my other candidates have suggested it, it is a third of the cost, and if we're gonna spend all this money on these seawalls, we better protect them. And we better protect this coast, because like I said before, it, it, it's it's uh, in a coastal community. It, it, it is our money. It, it is it brings in a lot of money for us, and we don't want to lose that. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, on these issues, again, I attended a meeting uh, some months back with a civil engineer from Woods Hole, talking about just that uh, dredging issues and beach nourishment, and I came away from that realizing just how complicated this whole issue is. Uh, because again, you're dealing with bureaucracy, you're dealing with homeowner issues, you're, you're dealing with uh, easements, and some people don't want that uh, dredge sand back on their uh, beach area in front because it's, it's gray in color or it's not pristine. Other issues that uh, come up, you know, people don't want access, so they can't do this work during the day, during a regular uh, work day. So there's all kinds of issues to explore as your state representative that I would do just that, work with uh, local officials, work with the DPW professionals, work with the Coastal Coalition, and also work with State Senator Pat O'Connor, who's been very proactive in this issue, getting additional uh, funds to look at alternative methods and with the Seaport Economic Council that Lieutenant Governor Chairs, that Sean just mentioned. Again, that's a great resource for our two towns to really look into and try to uh, make our case that we really need this uh, technology and we can uh, really use the resources that the state can, take, can give us to uh, make sure our community is a great place to live and to raise a family. So, Thank you very much. And Don, uh, wave attenuation devices. Again, I concur with the rest of the group that um, they're less costly and they can be very effective. So uh, I would work with my legislative colleagues to get additional funding to make that happen again in situ with the Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, we, we are aware of the time and we don't want to keep you, you know, all night. So we're combining a couple of her, uh, final questions and this one, um, do you think you'll be able to get additional help and funding with the opioid drug crisis locally? And in the same vein, what do you know about question one on the ballot concerning nurse patient ratios? So two, twofold. Sure. So the first part of the question is about the opioid crisis. And are you, do you think you'll be able to get additional help with funding for that? And the second part is about question one on the ballot concerning nurse patient ratios. By the way, I'm moving this around over that feedback for those who don't understand. I'm not just. <laughs> enjoy moving speakers around furniture. Uh, on the first question on the opioid crisis, I don't think there's a family I know that hasn't been affected by this. Uh, 
with some relative in horrible distress. It is slavery, in my opinion, for, uh, for heroin to be introduced to somebody. It's a chemical slavery, and we have learned with our recent vote on separating a difference, creating a difference between lower impact drugs, marijuana, for instance, and heroin. Uh, but we've all heard the horrific stories. Um, and largely it was introduced early on, uh, up to 20 years ago, with prescription opioids, which have different molecular connections with the brain tissue uh, than other painkiller drugs. My own situation, I'm a pretty healthy guy, but uh, I was flat out in Detroit after giving a speech. I just leaned down the wrong way to get a soda from a machine, crashed, couldn't move, got brought up in a backboard and such, and they tried to get me to get home Oxycontin. It was just at the point where the articles were being written about Oxycontin many years ago. And I said, I'm sorry, I'll grin and bear it. Um, I'll get home in pain if I have to, but I'm not going to take that. Give me something else that doesn't have an addictive effect because I was aware of that problem with other people in, in an extended family, as many people do. Uh, prevention is huge. I still remember the fifth grade in Marshfield, the wonderful programs they just started introducing against drugs, cigarette smoking, you know, basically health instruction. Uh, I know Sean has worked hard on this on school committee, and I agree with his statement in the past that that education should start at the fifth grade. Other people think we can wait till seventh or eighth. Nope, Sean's right on that one, fifth grade. Let's get the education in early. So prevention is the most important piece. On the nursing ratios, on question one, as a business person, I see more and more mandates uh, being put on private businesses and industries. Um, I am aware that the Nurses Association and other interest groups uh, are very concerned about decreased ratios. They feel, on their point of view, that it creates hazards to the patient. So I'm aware of the issue. I would have to look very closely at it because I know as a private business person uh, who faced a lot of these mandates, training fees, you know, one one fee after another, one regulation after another. It takes a lot of time out of a small business to do that. It prevents them often from hiring other people. So I'm gonna say I would have to look at that specific bill, and I'm getting a warning now, but uh, I'm going to stay open on that question one. I, I'm sorry, it's a further study. We all know that the opioid crisis is one of the hottest topics in legislation. In, uh, 2018. That being said, we have to look at it in a multi-level perspective. We can't look at it in terms of criminality and people who are going through gateway situations with very bad um, life, if you will. But we have to look at it in terms of the fact that once a, a person, whether it's a person who had a motorcycle accident and was on a medication and now becomes a uh, habit, for me to be able to have uh, medication on a basis, or people who actually are taken for recreational use and realizing the dangers that cost their lives and their livelihoods, not to mention the fact that the hardships of the families itself. There's just way too many people, even if it's two people in a situation, for example, or, or 20 or 30, whatever, it's way too many people. That should never happen at all. What I am encouraged to find out, though, is uh, Mr. Cantwell is what, as much as, and Denise Carlin, both are working together to be able to have a space in the cells of prisons when prisoners from uh, drug overdose and, and drug addiction get out. Because the big problem with that is the fact that when a person is not getting treatment while they're in jail, for example, they come out, their tolerance is lower, and therefore they end up overdosing very quickly. So I think that it's very, very important that we get tackled problem in a multidisciplinary point of view. The patient, as I call the person who's affected by the drugs, uh, are actually patients and not criminals. We have to help them. Unfortunately, since we uh, marched though, we have a great, uh, strong family support system. But other, other cities or other towns are not as lucky as ours. And education is extremely important at the high school and junior high school level. But so is it outside of the high school. So, regarding the second uh, question regarding Proposition 1 or uh, the Bill number 1, I think it's really important to have a low patient um, nurse uh, 
we love uh, Rachel. My wife is a physician, and she tells me all the time that the health care of the patient constantly gets compromised by having low funding for the um, programs, but more importantly, in terms of just being able to help the patient itself. The patient's are number one in that situation. And I think that's really important. We have to be mindful of that. What are the patient's needs first that are personal needs or like store of dollars? Thank you. So there's a few things that I want to address. The first is uh, I'm very proud to be running as a candidate on the Democratic ticket. And I think that uh, part of that um, sense of pride is due to my focus um, on the environment and climate change. Uh, and I think that this is a, something that differentiates me as a candidate. Uh, when speaking about sand mining, that is not one, a fiscally responsible thing to do, and two, as someone that works in a local industry that uh, and lives in a town, two, you know, the posts represent two towns that their local economy is based on fisheries, that sand mining that would destroy habitat in an already struggling fishery is not something that should be explored whatsoever. And it's something that is not fiscally responsible to pump sand onto a beach that, as Nate said, is going to wash away. As an environmentalist, as someone that cares about our renewable resource, we should not be destroying habitat. And making the water deeper by pumping sand onto the beach does not make it safer. It actually uh, makes it worse. So uh, that's something that I have to, I had to clarify. When it comes to the opioid epidemic, Jim Cantwell was such a great advocate for this particular issue. We know that it's a huge problem in this district. I'm proud to have been endorsed by his former campaign manager, Stephen Darcy. The, he believes that I'm the best candidate to continue his work ethic on that. And what Jim found out about the opioid epidemic is that we only spent 3% of our funds on the upstream side of things. Downstream prevention is very important, but that and making sure that people that are addicted have available beds and available treatment centers is crucial. But attacking the problem at the root of the problem is what we need in our, in our next legislature. Implementing an, a comprehensive educational curriculum in all of our public schools, and also going after pharmaceutical companies that encourage doctors to overprescribe these drugs, and they also make money providing treatment in the treatment centers. It's a direct conflict of interest, and it's wrong. Third, when it comes to the nurses uh, question, I think that uh, as someone that is a member of organized labor, um, I have spoken with the Massachusetts Nurses Association. The nurses take care of us uh, when we are in need, and I look forward to supporting them uh, in making sure that they're taken care of with state, uh, safe patient limits. Other, another thing that's facing the nurses as well is there's a huge problem with um, sexual harassment and sexual assault in hospitals not being um, given to police officers uh, and those violations not being addressed in the court system. Um, I, as the next legislator, will not only support the nurses and making sure that they have state staffing, but also that they're safe in their working environments and that if someone violates their personal space, that they are held accountable for their uh, for their actions. Thank you. Well, so so I'm glad to hear uh, that my fellow candidates here uh, believe that it's important to address uh, the opiate crisis with education uh, because that's something that I've been working on uh, since I was elected to the Marshfield School Committee and in my second term is something that I take very seriously. Um, we're losing a generation. Uh, we are seeing uh, so many people lost to this horrible disease. I think everybody here has a personal story about how it impacts your family uh, or your friends in one way or another. Uh, you know, here in, in, in situate in Marshfield, we need to be proactive and we need to recognize that, uh, that, that there's, there's certain ways to combat this in terms of treatment. We need to be funding more treatment opportunities. Uh, that's something that uh, the, the state legislature has addressed in the past and needs to continue addressing. Uh, but we also need to be making sure that we're investing in prevention 
Uh, Anne Marie Galvin is here. She's, she's of course, the leading voice on that work with Representative Campbell. Um, you know, we've, we've done um, you know, so much and as a member, of, not just of the school committee in Marshfield, but also as a member of, of Marshfield Facts, uh, somebody who's been proactive in the community fighting this issue. Uh, I, I know exactly what we can do. And, and, and just to say that, uh, you know, in terms of prevention, we have a unique opportunity with public education to make sure that we're being proactive. 96% of our students in Massachusetts go through public education. We need uh, a comprehensive uh, health curriculum. That's something that I am very knowledgeable on and that I'll be bringing to the State House on your behalf. Situate, by the way, should be praised on what they do in terms of their health curriculum and how it incorporates drug awareness. But there's still so much more we can do and we can bring in even more funding for that. That's what I'll be fighting for. Uh, and I want to say, on the nurses question too, first of all, is two of my aunts are nurses. Uh, when this issue came up, I sat down with them, uh, we discussed it, and uh, they told me why they think safe patient limits is a good thing, uh, and I told them that I'd be voting for that question. Uh, and I do want to address what, what Pat just said about safety in the workplace, and I'm glad you brought that up, because I'd like to make sure everybody knows that uh, the first bill that I wrote on Beacon Hill four years ago, something that keeps getting inching closer and closer to the finish line, and something that I'll be pushing for as a state rep, is a bill that would make the assault of a health care provider a felony. Massachusetts is one of only 15 states where it is not a felony. So I agree with you there, Pat, and I've done something about that. I've written a bill, and we're trying to push that through. Even after I left the, the State House, I've been advocating for that. It's in third committee, which is a good threshold there, and we're hoping to get it across the finish line before the end of this session. But just in case that doesn't happen, I'll be refiling that bill at the State House next legislative session, and I'll be pushing for that to pass too. That's something that I've been uh, working on, and that's something that I want to fight for on your behalf, on behalf of all health care providers uh, in Marshfield and Situate and across uh, Massachusetts. It's very important to me. It's the first bill I wrote, uh, and, and so I appreciate you bringing that up because it's an important issue. I'm going to jump right into the, um, the nurse patient ratios. Um, there's, there's a big misnomer out there. So the American Nurse Association is the one that, that is against it. And actually, Mass Nurse Association, they broke apart from the American Nurse Association. And the reason they did that is because the Mass Nurse Association is actually bedside nurses. The American Nurse Association is nurse managers. That is why they are against it. You know, the uh, Mass Nurse Association is pushing for safer patient limits. They, they want to protect their employees. Uh, they want a one-to-one -one ratio in the ICU, which we all deserve. Um, American Nurse Association, they're concerned about the weight in the ER. Now, that has nothing to do with, uh, with patient ratios. That has everything to do with the healthcare system as a whole right now. Um, too many people right now are taking advantage of the, uh, of the emergency room. They use it as a primary care facility, and that was never the intent of it. Uh, as far as the opioid crisis, I've been knee-deep in it since the onset. Uh, I'm a firefighter, I'm a paramedic. I, I work in the ambulance, I have dealt with it. Um, it is a multi-level, multi-faceted problem. There is no one solution to it. Um, there's the, the healthcare aspect, the mental health aspect, and then there's the, just the prevention of it. And as far as the prevention of it, I think we have to hit it head on. We have to get to these children um, before they get to middle school. And we got to work with the education um, side of it. And we can work with the, the public safety side of it. And we can coordinate something that's very cost effective. I, I, I bet most people will donate their time and, and go educate these children um, and to introduce them. Bring, uh, if you can bring in someone like a Chris Heron, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with him. He was a uh, um, NBA basketball player from Durfee, uh, had a huge drug problem, lost everything, and, and he came back. Um, now he, he public speaks, and, and for the most part, he does it for a very reasonable price. Someone like that, just to introduce, um, to talk to these children. Um, maybe even bring back some people that are, are recovering addicts now, you know, that, that tell these kids, you know, this is what I went through. This is what to avoid. This is um, th this is what I was going through at the time, and this is why I did it. You know, you know? And, and, and don't be afraid to reach out for help. Don't be afraid to tell someone that you have a problem. Um, and, and as as far as the mental health aspect, there there's these facilities. Taunton has ample room. Bridgewater State has ample room. We just have to find the funding to, to fund these facilities. To, to get these beds available for these people um, and, and get them to a recovery stage where, and 
then not only that, get them functioning in society, so they are less likely to to have a uh, to to go back using again. Um, and, and I think those are the, the stepping stones. That's where you start, and it doesn't end there. But you know, like I said before, there is no one answer to this problem. Thank you, Nathaniel. As you mentioned, I think the uh, celebrity speaker or prominent speaker coming into the classroom is an effective tool to use. Unfortunately, I've had a, a co-worker uh, pass away from an overdose and uh, he's from a prominent Brockton family. His brother gives a very uh, emotional and overwhelming uh, talk to uh, young students and it makes it quite an impression on them because uh, you know, my co-worker was a, a, a great guy, uh, but he got involved with uh, opioids and it led to, uh, unfortunately, his death. And uh, this was made, you know, it's, it's made known to the kids and they see the gravity of it, of getting involved. Uh, but we also stress what you can do, you know, to, uh, to remove yourself from that temptation. As a deputy sheriff, I've seen firsthand also the effects of, of opioid abuse. I've been trained in Narcan, unfortunately, uh, how to use it, and um, I know how to use it, and I've seen on the streets what can happen to people that abuse the, uh, the drugs. But I also understand it's a funding for prevention and for treatment, and we have some great uh, groups already going with the state through Governor Baker's administration, also here in Plymouth County. We've got the Plymouth County Drug Abuse Task Force, uh, chaired by Plymouth County DA Cruz and Sheriff McDonald. They're doing great work. Also down in Plymouth, we have uh, groups that are reaching out rather than you know putting them behind bars. If someone has the effects of opioids and they have encounters with law enforcement, instead of putting them in jail, they reach out to their family members and try to get them on the right path. So that's the approach I would take. I would continue to get uh, funding from the state and partner with groups such as the uh, South Shore Peer Recovery Group and uh, Marshfield Facts. These are great groups in both our towns that have been doing great work. And I understand, you know, I realize what uh, Representative Campbell has done, and I will continue to in his footsteps and do even more. Also, uh, as far as the nurse patient ratios go, I too have uh, family members in healthcare and as nurses. Uh, to me, they've expressed their concerns about this mandate because they feel that they know what's best for the patient and it would limit their care for the individual patients. So, uh, myself, I would have to look at this legislation uh, more specifically, uh, but right now I would be uh, not in favor of it. Uh, however, you know, I'm, I support nurses. I think they're all saints in my, I've seen what they've done for my mother and my father while you know, they were both alive, and uh, for all, anyone who goes in the hospital and is experiencing a sick relative or family member, how, what a great job they do. So, this is an issue that would uh, I would have to look into further. But, thank you, thank you all. You know, in consideration of the time, I'd like to ask each candidate to take only one minute to answer this last question. It's something that, that is on all of our minds, I think, and it's, uh, it, it's an important one to, to ask tonight. How do you plan to help communities alleviate the rising cost of flood insurance? And you know, why don't, why don't I start with, uh, with Ed this time and move backwards? <laughs> I should have done that alternating anyway, but. Thank you. Great. Well, to alleviate uh, the rising flood insurance costs, uh, myself, probably like a lot in this room, uh, years back I was surprised to receive a letter from my um, mortgage bank saying that I needed flood insurance. I'm approximately three miles away from the beach, so it's a surprise to me. I was in the flood zone all of a sudden, which increased my uh, insurance uh, significantly. I appealed it. I spent my own money to get a uh, civil engineer surveyor. I appealed and I won. I was out of the flood zone. But then, of course, six months later, FEMA redrew the flood map again, so I was back in it. Uh, so, to, to my dismay, I appealed it again. This time, I, I'm still in it. So, this to me is uh, very close to the heart. 
I'm sorry, seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I would work hard with the uh, uh, state bureaucracies to lower this, lower these costs for all the homeowners. Thank you. All right. Super fast. <laughs> um, what I would like to see, um, I, I, I'm going to float on myself. Um, and what, what happened in Marshfield is, especially where I live, uh, the FEMA did not get credit for the like in Green Harbor. And they essentially said that we we credited it. We have to redo all the flood maps on the East Coast. And obviously, it's government they're not going to do that. Um, but on the flip side, um, I would love to see a tiered flood insurance plan where you have a gold standard where if, you, if you're in fear of losing your house, the, the gold standard would cover everything. Gold's nuts, everything. You lose your house, it floats out the sea, hey, we're going to replace it. You know, and all the way to where you can have different tiers and you pay the bottom tier, which is the bare minimum, and you get bare minimum. Sure. I'm a really quick um Joe Rossi is here. He and, he and I went to high school together. Nobody knows more on this issue than Joe Rossi, but uh, we're all trying to make sure that we uh, explain what we do now. Which, uh, you know, I think experience really matters on this issue too, because we've seen Jim Campbell have a massive role in changing federal policy when uh, you know the, the federal government came out with new maps uh, that were created with faulty science. Uh, that that for my friend Marge Bates, who lives on Lighthouse Point, would have, would have drastically increased your flood insurance. And, uh, you know, the family home that I grew up in and lived in for 22 years is in a flood zone, but it's about two and a half miles from the shoreline. Uh, so that's that's uh, you know that's faulty science, and uh, it's important that we realize uh, who's being overcharged for flood insurance, and it's also important that we realize uh, that the science needs to be correct because there are certain people who are in a flood zone and we need to make sure that the science is correct for them too because if they need our assistance, they need insurance to rebuild, we need to make sure that it's there. So I'll be fighting uh, for this issue just as Jim Cantwell did. Uh, we've done that on the Coastal Caucus. Uh, legislation uh, won't uh, impact this issue, so I'll continue that fight. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, uh, I'm the only candidate in the primary election that lives in a flood zone that faces this issue every day. And, uh, it's really important that we have the infrastructure to protect our, our coastal homes. Um, as Sean said, the flood insurance maps need to be accurate. Uh, some of the ones that they've done in the past was based on California title data, uh, not data that we face here uh, in New England. Also, when claim numbers go up in cost, it increases premiums. So if we have the coastal infrastructure like wave attenuation devices and effective seawalls, the damage won't be as much to our coastal communities and the rising costs of the flood insurance will, uh, will slow. So I will be advocating to make sure that we have the infrastructure to protect the coastal homes, which will protect the amounts that are paid out. Tell me what the risks are, what the costs are. Am I in the flood zone? 
no service for Armstrong. You're one house away from the flood zone, you don't have to pay flood insurance. And I said, well, that's good news. I talked to my neighbors, some of whom grew up on the street, and they said, not since the house has moved onto the foundation in 1948 has the water ever come this close. In the last storm, I still was a homeowner, the last several storms, water didn't even come close. Yet I faced that with a mortgage. There should be some grandfathering. I entered into a mortgage with faith, and then I got hit with the extra flood insurance, like a lot of people unfair once we ended those obligations. So there should be grandfathering, I think, in any flood insurance rate system. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Um, I want to thank each, each of you individually so we can cement your names in our minds. Um, Joe Armstrong, Craig Valdez, Patrick Kearney, Sean Castello, Nathaniel Powell, and Edward O'Connell. And I want to thank you so much. If anyone has questions that I'm sure these guys would love to answer them, if you want to do any one-on-one -on -one stuff, um, then I want to thank all of you for coming out, and also the Citroën Beach uh, Association for hosting us. Um, oh, very well. Um, Please, if anyone is able to stay a little while to help put away chairs, we'd appreciate it. Thank you.